Hey, I'm Dan Thomas, and welcome to my channel for the newbie woodworker. Or for anyone, really. This video is about distractions in the workshop. Sorry, I just wanted to have a little fun. By the way, don't use your hand to push stock through the blade. Use a push stick like I actually did when I made this cut. Anyway, back to distractions. I want to talk about how we can reduce distractions when we're in the shop. Like, for instance, don't leave a pencil on your table saw during a cut. This subject is especially important to me because I have fairly severe ADD. That's Attention Deficit Disorder, in case you didn't know. And even though I take medication for it, which helps quite a bit, by the way, my mind can still wander off at the worst times, like when I'm in the middle of a cut, and that can lead to things like me touching the blade before it comes to a complete stop. Fortunately, I have a saw stop. That's all that happened to my thumb. And believe it or not, I've done it more than once. Pretty stupid, right? Actually, the effects of ADD don't have anything to do with intelligence, so it's not technically stupid, but it sure feels stupid. Some people have suggested that if I'm this easily distracted, Maybe I shouldn't be using power tools. Others have been more blunt about it, saying I'm too stupid to own a table saw. And you know what? It's hard to disagree with that, really. Not the stupid part, necessarily. But if I get distracted so easily, maybe I should quit woodworking. But I really don't want to do that. So I've been working on ways to help keep me safer in the shop, in spite of my distractibility. Here's an example, which I'm jokingly calling a stupid stop. I don't have all the answers, so I'm counting on you guys to jump in in the comments below with your experiences and ideas. So stick around and maybe we can help each other stay a little safer, and let's have some fun in the process. I'll talk more about my stupid stop in a moment. Like I said at the start, I don't have a lot of answers, so I really need you guys to help out in the comments. Tell us your disaster stories about getting distracted and what happened. And if you've got any tips on avoiding distractions, tell us about them, too. So even if we don't have anything to share, at least we can learn from your mistakes. But here's a few things I do know. I'll start with the boring ones first. Make sure your equipment is set up properly. This isn't a very good demonstration, but it'll have to do. I'm trying to show a fence that's towed out too much. That means that this end is too far this way. When you push your stock through the blade, it looks like it's pulling away from the fence. And while you're wondering what's going on, you stop paying attention to the blade. Not good. So like I said, make sure your equipment is set up right. I'm fairly messy in general. If there's a flat space somewhere, it's probably got crap piled on it. But I always try and keep the floor around my workbench and table saw clear. You don't want to step on or trip over something while running a power tool. If you're tired, stop working and save it for the next day. It'll wait. You make way more mistakes when you're tired. Have you ever been driving behind someone who's carrying on an animated conversation with a passenger? Or they're on the phone? You can just tell they're not paying attention, and it's only a matter of time before they drive off the road or run into somebody. It can be just about as dangerous to talk to people while you're woodworking. In this one time, at band camp, I st <laughs> Too much? Did it go too far? This thing has been freaking my wife out for days. Anyway, no talking while woodworking. For that matter, pets can be distracting, too. And, of course, no pencils on the table saw. Okay, I got us started. Now it's your turn in the comments below. Since there's been two times I stuck my thumb in the blade before it stopped spinning, I figured I should look into why that keeps happening. The first thing I notice is the sound of the motor stops before the blade stops. Here's what I mean. One more time. Now add in the shop fan. 
air conditioner, and the dust collector, and the sound of the saw stops way before the blade stops spinning. And somehow that tricks my mind into thinking the blade has stopped before it actually stops. Yes, you can still see it spinning, but apparently that's not enough for me. So let's talk about my stupid stop. First, it only works on a saw stop right now, and you'll see why in a moment, but I'll bet some of you smart electricians or engineers can figure out a way to adapt it to other saws. If so, leave a comment. Secondly, it's not really my solution. A guy named Tom Johnson came up with the idea and posted about it on the Saw Stop users group on Facebook. Tom calls it the Saw Stop light, by the way, but I prefer the stupid stop. Tom created a PDF with plans and wiring diagrams, and he was kind enough to let me share them for free on my website. The reason this only works on a saw stop right now is because it uses the status lights on the saw stop. But I can't see any reason someone couldn't come up with a way to monitor the saw blade or motor and trigger the lights that way. So come on all you smart people and start brainstorming. As I mentioned, a saw stop has two status lights on the front panel, one red and one green. The status lights can tell you all sorts of things, like the fact I just touched the blade. It won't let me start the motor until the light stops flashing. But what's relevant to the stupid stop is that when you turn off the motor, the green light flashes until the blade stops. The green light flashing means don't touch the blade, it's still spinning down. And we already know I need to be told that. The problem is the status lights are under the front of the table, and you can't see them when you're using the saw. Tom's great idea brings the status lights up above the table, where you can see them even when you're using the saw. And the best part was that I didn't have to modify my table saw to use it. The electronics are on the side of the saw in this black box. Tom's plans use a smaller box, but I got this bigger one so I had enough room to get everything assembled. I stuck a couple of adhesive back magnets to the back of the box, and the magnets hold the box to the cabinet. This is the on-off switch, and this goes to the power adapter. These wires go to the light tower. I put the light tower here, but it could go just about anywhere. I attached it with magnets so it's easy to move if I need to. These wires go to the two light sensors. Both lights light up right now because they sense the light in the shop. But if I cover one up, you can see the light turn off. So I mounted the light sensors right on top of the status lights using cardboard and duct tape. This way the shop's ambient light won't affect them. So the only time they turn on is if the status lights turn on. Honestly, I didn't really even consider anything besides the cardboard and duct tape because it works perfectly and it's easy to remove if I need to. So here's how it works. You get two of these photo resistor boards, which come with the light sensors. You put the light sensors over the saw stop status lights. You add a power adapter to power everything and you attach the light tower to the other side of the boards. Looks easy, right? What could go wrong? Well, believe it or not, nothing. I know, can you believe it? I started out with Tom's list of parts and my tools, but I started to make changes right away. I got these little sticky feet for the PCBs. And as I mentioned earlier, I bought a bigger project box. I decided to use plugs for each set of wires going into the box. So if I accidentally yank on a wire, it won't affect the electronics inside the box. More on these in a moment. And I got this anti-static mat, although I didn't ground it, so I don't know how much help it was, except it did keep the parts from rolling away. Tom's plans had me cutting off the power adapter plug, so I had to solder a new one on. I had to keep reminding myself to put the cover and shrink wrap on before I soldered anything. Helping hands, worth its weight in gold. And there it is, good as new. This is the socket for the power plug. It would have been nice to have all the wires be the same colors, but whatever. The black and blue are ground, and the red and white are power. Here it is installed in the box along with the power switch. I guess I did make one mistake because I forgot I had to send the power wire through the toggle switch, so I had to cut and resolder this portion. Anyway, these go to the circuit board, and these go to the socket for the light tower. The four wire connector was pretty tricky to solder. There's four posts in a pretty tight area, but I managed. Soldering the matching socket was a royal pain in the butt. You have to put the wires in these little half pipes and somehow manage to solder them in place without moving them. But I got it right eventually. The three wire connector was basically the same as the four wire. Here's everything installed. You can see the circuit board stuck to the bottom on their little feet. I don't claim to be good at this kind of stuff, so I really don't care how it looks. This is how I felt turning it on.
You can see my hand shaking, but nothing caught on fire and it worked the first time. And once I installed it, it worked just like I hoped. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to leave comments for how to avoid distraction in the workshop and share your stories. Don't forget to click the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring the bell. Thanks!